Judges 21-25 is our text today. I don't apologize for the message this morning, but I do understand where some might think that Brother Brandon and I were studying in the same room this last week. I only I take that to be of God, because you know normally we're in John 17, and that's where we, I was planning to be this morning until the end of last week's message, and I was just drawn to the book of Judges. Maybe it's because I've been reading it, um, well, I'm past that now, but I, uh, in recent weeks I was in Judges in my own uh, private devotional time. And coming to, Judges is one of those books that we like to read because there's, it kind of reminds us of our lives. Maybe there's ups and downs, there's failures and successes. Until you get to chapter 17, and in chapter 17, it begins to get a little more difficult. Read about maybe the first house church in chapter 17 and 18, Micah. And I'm not going to elaborate on that. I could say a lot of things. But then you get to chapter 19. And chapters 19 through 21 are some of the most difficult chapters, I think, to read in the Scriptures. And then you get to the last verse. There is always a fundamental heart-level reason why any individual or culture declines morally and spiritually. There is always a fundamental heart-level reason why any individual or culture declines morally and spiritually. And this point is graphically made in the final chapters of Judges. I think these chapters stand as a monument to history, to us today, of what can happen when things go desperately wrong at the heart level. And so Judges in the writer of Judges ends with, it seems almost, maybe you've read Judges before and you've thought, that's a strange way to end a book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But that really is a summarization, isn't, isn't it? By the way, just so you know, these last chapters, 17 through 21, are really out of place chronologically. This is not where they belong. If Judges had, had been written chronologically, it's not written chronologically. That ought to be a, a red flag to us. There's something going on here. There's a message that is being declared. The events occur, uh, that are recorded here probably happened very early on in the life of the Judges and the nation of Israel. We know that. One, one clue is in, in Judges 20 and verse 28. It says, For the ark of the covenant was there in those days, and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days. That happened a long time ago, chronologically speaking. So this, these last five chapters are a summary and, and really an illustration of the truth that you heard in the last hour. A picture of a nation whose heart is idolatrous. There's clearly a point that the writer of this history of Israel wants us to see today. You remember Joshua's famous statement back in Joshua 24. This was just before the age of the judges. The, the age of the judges was, again, that's one of those difficult things. It, it, 450 years, we're told in one place in the book of Acts, but anywhere from 350 to 450, it depends on how it is 
evaluated how the numbers are added up, but it was a long time. And so from the end of Joshua over to Samuel was a long time as far as history goes. And the decline of this nation and the, the history of this nation was a, was a history of the up and down of a people who were constantly being pulled away from the Lord God. In Joshua 24, this is as Joshua was coming to the end of his death, as they stood in possession of the land that was promised to them, this is what Joshua said in verse 14, Joshua 24, 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a very common expression. We see it on the, uh, the entry doors of many houses, even in our own country today. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, drawing a line in the sand, as it were to which the nation of Israel responds in verse 24. The Lord our God we will serve, and His voice we will obey. And for a while they did. In part they did. But their incomplete obedience mixed with idolatrous religious practices of the land of Canaan. And as you get into the book of Judges, you'll see they did not do all that God's... They left, they left people. And they left the idolatrous worship, and they were plagued by what was left remaining. And they became pragmatic, and they became humanistic in their thinking. And it was continually leading them away from God and to the depths of immoral, senseless, and destructive behavior that we read about in the book of Judges, and in particular in these final chapters. Reading these final chapters of Judges is very difficult. I'm not going to read them today. I would suggest to you that if you're reading this for your own devotional purposes, read 19 through 21 as a unit. They go together. This is a dark time in the nation's history. The fact of the matter is we may see something of our own nation as we read these chapters. And the question that came to my mind as I read those chapters is, how did they get there? How did they get to this desperate place where these kinds of things could be written about a nation? And of course, that led to the question, how did we get here? Judges 21, 25 is the answer. And in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. I want those words to be burned into your thought process. I want those words to reach into your soul as you leave today. I want you to be guided in your life by the concepts of, the, uh, of those, those two principles. No king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Let's survey the events. Chapters 19 through 21. I'm overlooking many, many details, but here's a summary. Chapter 19 tells about a Levite, a preacher, who travels to retrieve his unfaithful concubine, What all she did, we don't know. The King James translates it as harlotry. There are others that translate the word unfaithful. But she went back to Bethlehem, Judah, where her father was for four months. And so the Levite decided to take a journey to his father-in-law where he knew his concubine or his wife was. After four days of generous hospitality... 
His father-in-law treating him royally, hospitably, which, by the way, was common in that day, common in that region of the world. To stay somewhere for days, they weren't on the clock like we are. We run in and run out. They didn't do that. They hung around. Hospitality was a huge thing in that day. So when you read about that in the account, it's not a strange thing that he stayed there for three days, and then his father-in-law said, stay another day. And then his father-in-law said, stay another day. Finally, the Levite said, i got to go. And so he left late in the day, north, to his home. As they traveled home, he and his servant and his concubine, they stopped for the night in a city of Benjamin called Gibeah. As they sat in the courtyard of that village or city, no one taking them in. The older man who was from the same region that this Levite was from, an older man came from the fields and he saw him there. And he told him, come, I'll put you up. They settled in for the night, no doubt feeling safe in a strange city, until noise was heard outside of the house. And then there was banging against the door, and some say that it was actually, there, was, there wasn't just knocking at the door, the, the ruckus was so strong and loud that they were actually pushing against the door. And what follows in the account is reminiscent of Sodom as unrestrained moral debauchery is unveiled. The host appeals to the debased mob, begging them to not harm his guest, calling it wickedness, but then offers his own daughter and the guest concubine for their unrestrained, darkened appetites. I still struggle with that. Just like in Sodom with Lot. I struggle with that. The unthinkable follows as the concubine became the object of the monstrous lust of these animals. She struggles. To return to the house where she dies with her hand on the threshold. It's graphic. God wants you to see something. He wants you to feel something. Do you feel the horror? Do you feel the disgust? Let me read chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. As he awakes the next morning to leave, to go home, he opens the door, and she's there lying at the threshold. And he said to her, up, let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and Got him into his place. So cold. And when he was coming to his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her together with her bones into twelve pieces and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so that all that saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt unto this day. Consider it, take advice, and speak your minds. Chapter 20. Of course, when word spread like it did, if the event had happened and word had spread by word of mouth, perhaps the response wouldn't have been so great, but seeing body parts, the visual aid, stirred up the passion 
of the rest of Israel. So that 400,000 soldiers from all Israel gather together to hold Gibeah accountable. By the way, the activity in Gibeah was so debased that Gibeah is referred to in one of the minor, minor prophets as the subject of depravity is being spoken of, as it was in Gibeah. It is a monument of depravity. And so we see the, the rest of Israel rising up against Gibeah, and then against the tribe of Benjamin, perhaps blinded by family connection. Oh, be careful there. Gibeah was a city of the Benjamites. Benjamin should have taken care of its own. Benjamin should have administered justice itself, but it didn't. In fact, Israel sent messengers all through Benjamin saying, hand over the ones, the evil men, wicked men, guilty of this atrocity, so that we can put them to death and rid this evil out of the land. And they said, no. We stand with Gibeah. They're family. Their family. Be careful of family ties. Be careful of what family ties can do to you when it comes to following the Lord God. Enraged by the atrocity of Gibeah and Benjamin's defense, rash vows were made by Israel. And Israel sets out to wipe the tribe of Benjamin out. And we can almost salute Benjamin for what they do, but be careful lest we also get carried away by the passion of vengeance and miss the point. You see, something's not right in Israel, and it goes beyond Benjamin. How do we know that? In chapter 20, God gives the green light for Israel to attack Benjamin. But then what happens? On the, the first attempt, there were 22,000, if I remember the story correctly, 22,000 of Israelites were slain by the Benjamites. 400,000, an army of 400,000 trained soldiers going against a nation, a portion of the nation, the Benjamites, which numbered about 26,000. Who should have won? Sure, there were 700 Benjamites who were expert marksmen, but we're talking about 400,000. Just sheer numbers should have meant an easy demolition. But it wasn't so. They ask God, should we go again? He says, yes, they go again. 18,000 or 40,000 Israelites die at the hand of the Benjamites. God is speaking to His covenant people. God is saying something to the nation of Israel. At some point, it seems like they may have been shaken enough. We read about tears being shed. We read about fasting. We read about them listening, waiting upon God. It seems like maybe they're being moved to some degree. They seek counsel from God. And God tells them to go a third time. And He says, I will deliver Benjamin into your hands in victory. And that's what happened. And so Israel routs Benjamin. 25,000 plus of Benjamin's army was put to death. In fact, we're told there were only 600 men remaining of the Benjamites, and they fled to a rock called Remen for safety, to hide themselves. Cowards. I'm not saying I wouldn't have done the same thing. While Israel turns back from the chase of those men and goes back through the nation, through the nation of Benjamin, and wipes out every city, burns everything, women, children, 
everything. Chapter 21. What have we done? What have we done? Given time to consider what remains, 600 men. There are no women now. We're going to lose a tribe. In fact, one of the questions that the Israelites ask is, why, God, why is there going to be the loss of a tribe? And so in an attempt to cover the impassioned vengeance, they come up with a plan. And you can read about it in chapter 21. And the plan that they come up with, it's always disturbed me when I've read that. Which city didn't come together to go up against the Benjamites? Jabesh Gilead. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll go to Jabesh Gilead and we'll wipe out everyone in that city except for those who have never uh, uh, been with a man sexually. And we'll take them and give them, these virgins, as wives to the 600 men. They came up with 400 men that way. But that wasn't enough. So what did they do? Well, there's a party going on, a festival. And during this festival, women come out to dance in the streets. And so what you guys should do is go hide in the field. And if you see a woman that you like, she's yours. Has that ever disturbed you when you've read that? That is not of God in one sense. In one sense, it is not of God. That is not a godly way to deal with the sin that has preceded. And may I suggest to you, be careful not to compound sins trying to resolve the consequences of sin. Did you hear that? We, we often do that. We can actually make things worse. But oh, you see God's mercy in all of this, God's grace in all of this. It's an amazing thing how God even takes sin and He uses it for His glory. Did you know that? The greatest display of that is at the cross. That wasn't a just activity. That was an unjust activity. And yet look what has come of that. Sin is all over chapter 21, and yet God used it. And there were blessings that came out of it. The first king was Saul. He was a Benjamite. Benjamin did recover. It took years for them to recover, but they did recover. And Jabesh Gilead, you remember reading about that later on? In fact, the connection between Jabesh Gilead and Saul later on in the history of Israel, they were the ones that actually went and took the body of Saul and his sons from the wall and brought them back to give them a proper burial. Do you remember? That's Jabesh Gilead. Interesting. And you know who else came from the tribe of Benjamin? Saul of Tarsus, the apostle Paul. Do you see the grace of God? Even in the midst of these atrocities. How did they get to this point? How did a nation that claimed Jehovah as their God get to this place? How does any nation do that? How, how does any church get to such a place? How, how does any family, how does any individual get to such a place? And the answer is very clear. No king in Israel. Every man did that which is right in his own eyes. This is not a summary statement of the civil or political condition of a nation. It's not simply saying there was no king in Israel like the other kings of the nations around Israel. That's what they wanted. Israel wanted a king like the other nations around them. This statement, this summary statement is not saying they weren't like the nations around them, they were saying, that's the problem. They weren't like the nations around them. They had no king. But it wasn't a human king that is in view. In fact, Jehovah told Samuel 
You can read about it in 1 Samuel 8 and chapter 10 and then chapter 12. Samuel, who was the last of the judges, Samuel, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. There was no king in Israel. This is a statement evaluating the spiritual condition of God's covenant people. With their hearts not bowed to Jehovah God, they did what seemed right in their own eyes. And brethren, this explains the basest expressions of sin in the culture. This is how they got there. But this also explains the attitude and response of the culture to these base activities of these Benjamites. They rallied together with full attention upon the atrocities, that is, the rest of the nation of Israel, bent on righting the wrong, bent on administering justice. And by the way, that was right to a point. But they were ignoring the very root existing in the nation at large. 40,000 of them. God never brought such a, such a destruction of His people except that a message was being sent, something's not right. 40,000 Israelites. Gone. God is, through this incident, screaming at them, something is not right. You want to be like the nations around you. And I am telling you, I am your king. But there is no king. Viewed from their vantage point, from their perspective, they wanted to do what was right in their own eyes rejecting God as their king. You read the book of Judges. They repeatedly turned to the ways of the ungodly. Every man did that. Listen to this. Which was right in their own eyes. They weren't doing what they were concluding was wrong. in their minds as they were viewing things. And this is what happens when you separate yourself from the true and the living God. You begin to see things very wrongly. And you think you're right. And you begin to look at the culture around you. And you begin to ask questions. And you listen to the questions. You get online and you do a Google search. What is everybody saying, Brandon? What are they saying out there? And you read it. And you think, well, maybe they have a point. Has that ever crossed your mind? Maybe they have a point. Every man did that which was right. Each person determining what was right. Why? Because there's no king in Israel. There's no authority. There's no absolute. Take away the king and you're left to yourself. You're left to humanistic thinking. You're left to your own reasoning. You're left to your own culture. And so you rally around your culture to determine what's right and what's wrong. Because there's no king in Israel. Can you hear the root of the problem? Can you hear the root of the problem in our own day? Here it is. It's not complicated. You do not have, a, have to have a four-year seminary degree to figure this one out. You just have to have a Bible and the Holy Spirit in you and listen. Listen. Listen to what God's saying. And like Israel, we are too prone to stop short in our evaluation of sins 
of our day. We're prone to stop short. You see, God acknowledging morally sensitive people rally together against the obvious. We hear of gang rapes. The concubine. And who in here, or who among a morally sensitive people aren't appalled by that? We hear of human sex trafficking. I started to bring out statistics today just to be graphic in our own day. There's some graphic material here. You don't see it, but it exists. And then when you see it and you hear it, there's an alarm that goes off. How could they? Who are they? Let's cut them up. Let's annihilate them. Let's do away with them. Sexual perversions of all sorts, many of those perversions associated with the effects of drugs and drug addiction, methamphetamines. I don't suggest you even researching this, but if you did, there are things going on in our nation, in large cities of our nations, of our nation, that I didn't know was going on. But it's, it's out there. It's in the public. It, it's not even being done in the secret club scene. It's being paraded in the very streets of large cities. We see images of dismembering of bodies. Abortions. And those have been posted on Facebook and other social media so that you can see it. If you can stomach it, and you're rightly disturbed. If you are disturbed, you ought to be disturbed. But brethren, anyone with a moral compass would rise together to cry out against such horrific crimes. And we should rise up, rise up and cry out against horrific crimes of our day. But hear me when I say that the, the basest of sins and crimes in our culture did not happen overnight. The things that we're seeing paraded in the public place today did not happen overnight. The decisions that are being made, even in our Supreme Court, did not happen over... How, how, how they even thought they could make some of the decisions they have made and not have an outcry from this nation, that did not happen overnight. When Jesus walked upon the earth, there were things that the Pharisees would not do because they were afraid of the people. We're not there. We've declined. And it began as we started determining what was right in our own eyes. And I suppose I have to be careful here for, I haven't studied this one out, but it came to my mind, I'll throw it out for what it's worth. I said early on in my ministry, when I, was hearing, when I was hearing people say, abolish the Ten Commandments, do away with the Ten we don't need the Ten Commandments in our culture anymore. We have the Holy Spirit. I said way back in my 20s, I said, you know, that message is not going to have too great of an effect now because this is a generation that was brought up under the Ten Commandments. But wait a generation or two. And I didn't think about it till just now. We are a generation away from when I first started saying that. And what do we have in our culture?
I know it's a big, a big, discuss, big subject to discuss, and I'm not trying to answer all the questions surrounding it right now, but brethren, you better be very careful when you start trashing the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments. Be careful. What are you going to follow? Are we doing what is right in our own eyes? And I'm convinced that we are living in a generation of people who have been brought up to do what is right in their own eyes. And we may emotionally and perhaps even rationally lash out as Israel against Benjamin. But do you hear me when I say it began in the churches? It began with us. And it may satisfy our sense of justice toward the perpetrators of base crimes, but are we overlooking the root that may be affecting us more than we realize even to this very day that we, to some degree or another, are doing what seems right in our own eyes? Doing what is right, not seems. What is right, we've concluded it's right with no authority. You have no authority for saying it's right. You've just concluded it's right. God's evaluation of all of Israel, not just Benjamin. God's evaluation of all of Israel, even those who appear to be on the right side of the, of the law. His evaluation went deeper than just the surface. The surface is horrendous. The surface is bloody. The surface is atrocious. The surface is horrible. It is in our own generation. But brethren, we've got to go behind the surface. We've got to get to the, to the why. We've got to get to the heart of the issue. Do you see what I'm saying? And the heart of the issue is, from God's vantage point, no king, no king in Israel, every man doing what is right, in his own eyes. And so as God looks at us, as God looks at your life, what is his evaluation? Do you care? Does it matter to you? Why are you so inconsistent in serving him? Why are you so incensed with the gross sins of the nation and you want justice and yet you overlook the sins of your own life, which may not be considered criminal, at least not in the courts of our land, but what about God's court? When a nation, church, family, or a person does that which is right in his own eyes, God is ignored, and the result will be incremental departure from the living God. Perhaps we will proudly decry the obvious sins of others in the culture, but we will simultaneously slide ourselves. That ought to concern us. What's the solution? That's the problem. What's the solution? We need a king. And we need a king after God's own heart. And that wouldn't be Saul. God gave you want a king like those around you? I'll give you a king like those around you. And Saul was given. But in 1 Samuel 13 and verse 14, God gave Israel a king, it says, after his own heart. And brethren, this is the message of the Bible right here. There needs to be a king. 
And there needs to be a king in Israel. And there needs to be a king at Community Baptist Church. There needs to be a king in your life. And you come to the New Testament, and here's what you find. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, right out of the gate. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And it was this man, the man Christ Jesus, of whom it was said as he rode into Jerusalem days before his crucifixion, Behold, thy king cometh. Riding, sitting on an ass's colt. What did Israel do? What did the Jews do? The same thing they were doing in Judges. For the most part, they rejected it. They wanted. We will not have this man to rule over us. Why? By the way, as Brandon said in the last hour, autonomous Christianity is no Christianity. It's dangerous. I want to read Acts chapter 13, summarizing. The Apostle Paul summarizing. The point that I'm making here, Jesus Christ is this King that you need in your life, that we need in our church, that we need in our families, that we need in our nation. Acts chapter 13, verse 19, And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them, By Lot. That's the beginning of Judges. After that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years, which may be saying it was 450 years after when they came out of Egypt, or describing the years of the judges, and that's a debated point. But this is not debated until Samuel the prophet, the last of the judges. And afterward, they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David. He raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. There's your king, Jesus, the fulfillment of all that was prophesied in the Old Testament, the the end of the seed of David. He He is the one that was promised. He is the king of Israel. He is the king that God calls us to, to trust in, to bow before. Jesus is the king of Israel. And He is the one before whom Jew and Gentile must bow and worship and serve. Please, Listen to me today when I say that it's not enough to be angered by the gross injustices of life, either against you or against others. It's not enough for you to be angered by the despicably sinful expressions of mankind around you. That's not enough. You need a king.
Because if there is no king, you will live the rest of your life. I don't care how religious you are. You will live the rest of your life doing what is right in your own eyes. Even joining yourself to a religious group. Even trying to be good. Earn your way to heaven. Or whatever it is. Or going to the other extreme and embracing the base, gross, immoral expressions of our day. Either way, you you're end in the same place before the judgment of God with, without a Savior. You see, if you have a Savior, you have a King. He's called the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And your life will be different because you're following the King. And God wants His people. He wants you. If you claim to be His child here today, He wants you to address the root of the problem in your life. And too many times we get focused on what's wrong on the surface. What's disturbing the peace? What's disturbing the peace is that person or that person or this situation or my circumstances or, or the culture in which I live. And none of those things really get to the root of the problem. Remember, Gibeah was not born in a day. Israel's repeated falls into idolatry were not momentary slips. There was a fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem was this. They didn't have a king. They weren't bowed to anyone but themselves. And they were doing, every man doing what was right in their own eyes. The question we ought to be asking ourselves individually or as a family or as a body of believers and even as a nation is, Lord Jesus, what is it that you want of us? What is it that you want of us? You see, the answer to our national problems is not a new president. It is not a new Congress. It is not a new Supreme Court. And, and I say, just like Israel and Benjamin should have been concerned about what was, what was going on in Gibeah and should have, justice should have been brought to bear on that situation, I would say to you, we ought to be concerned about what's going on in our nation. And I am not trying to suggest to you to ignore seeking to make a statement, even in a public way. But that's not the answer, really. The answer is a new king. Wouldn't that be something? If we could hear a, a president of the United States get on live television and say, Hey folks, I'm not the one you need to be listening to. You need to be listening to Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be something? Or, perhaps as good as that, follow me as I follow Christ. That's a leader. That's a king under the king. That's a shepherd under the chief shepherd. That's what we need. The answer to our church problems is the same. The answer to your family problem is the same. The answer to your personal problems, it's all the same. Turn from what seems right in your own eyes and follow King Jesus. When you're answering the question, please listen to me. When, you're, when you hear these words coming out of your mouth, well, I feel, or it seems to me, or I think, alarm bells ought to be going off. What does our king say? What does our king say? And it may be that we have to get on our knees before God and we have to say, Oh, King, King Jesus, lead me, show me. 
It, and it may be that we, we need to do that together. And oh, may, may this spirit, as I prayed earlier, sweep over Community Baptist Church, that, that this would mark the spirit of this church. Not just one person, but the spirit of the church. And as I've said before, we're, we're made up of individuals, so it, it has to begin with you. And collectively then, there's that spirit of submission with which God is pleased. So how is it with you? Are you worshiping and serving the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus, and doing what seems good to Him? Are you satisfying your conscience because you're ticked about some of the grossly immoral things going on in our culture and you think yourself to be on the right side because you're angered? Just sleep. There's a righteous anger, but that satisfies you while there is sin in your own camp, sin in your own heart that you're not dealing with. If this is not the leading thought of your life, I do have a king. And I'm not living my life the way I want to live it. I'm living my life the way my king wants my life lived. If that's not your attitude today, I say to you, repent. Please, please. That's not a negative word. Repent is not a negative word. It's the most positive thing you can do. Repent. Turn away from that spirit. Bow. Bow today. And, and you know what? When you wake up tomorrow, or maybe I should say when you leave the service today, but when you wake up tomorrow, start the new day with the same spirit. I bow. I bow. Not my will. Yours be done. Just like King Jesus. Follow Him. Full surrender. In fact, I was going to sing, I surrender all, to conclude the service today, but John beat me to it. But that's okay. We'll sing the one right next to it. But I surrender all. That captures the thought. No longer doing what seems right in your own eyes. Father, Father,